Michael, welcome back to Paper Napkin Wisdom. Thrilled to join you here today. Well, thanks for having me back. So lots has changed for you. Uh, you you've got a book out, brand new book. It, it went on the Amazon bestseller list pretty quickly. And, and uh, so, so tell us a little bit about that and then we'll jump right into your paper napkin. Okay. Well, actually, the, the book is related to the paper napkin. I was actually, uh, last summer, I was back in England with one of the clients that I have there. Um, and we were actually reviewing the last three years where she's achieved five-fold increase in her sales and profits. Actually, profits have gone up by more than that. And, and we were actually debriefing the progress that she's made and what she learned along the way. And we discovered a number of different things. But the, the, the biggest single thing is that, you know, this whole notion of thinking big, it's just not enough. And the other thing we found was that there's a bunch of myths and misconceptions that get in people's way that actually stop them from growing their companies. So really what the book is about it is it describes the perspective shifts that this woman went through over the three years that she and I have worked together and what are some of the things that she noticed. And it was interesting because through this whole process of writing this book, one of the things that I did was it, forced or helped me clarify for myself, what exactly is it that A, stops people from growing, and B, what can actually move them past the things that stop them? That's, that's awesome. So, and, and I think that's a beautiful segue to your paper napkin. Can you describe it to the people that are listening? Okay, so, so it's titled Thinking Big is Not Enough. It's the same title as the book. Now, what I've got is, you know, if anybody uh, isn't, I guess just sort of a background to the napkin, you know, vision is very exciting. People, aspirations, thinking of how big they can make their businesses, all the kind of a difference they can make. You know, it's what, it's limbic energy. And limbic energy is very contagious. I mean, if, you know, if I walk into a room and everybody's laughing and joking, I start to laugh and joke with them. If I walk into a room and everybody's somber and quiet, all of a sudden my mood starts to go down. I mean, that's the energy of limbic energy. It's also the energy of vision. That's why vision is so compelling and so appealing. Um, but the other half of the story is structure. Vision without structure either creates chaos or it'll fall flat. So where vision is very fast energy, you can do a lot. Structure is sort of slow, stable energy. Now, it's interesting because structure by itself doesn't do the trick either. Structure without vision is like slogging through the mud. But I got to tell you, structure does provide the underpinning for vision, and it allows for real, sustainable growth and freedom. And so really, if you take a look, you know, people say, why do people – have difficulty in growing their businesses. I mean, you know, the statistics these days, it used to be 20 years ago, 85% of all businesses would fail in their, businesses would close within five years. That means only 15% of businesses actually survive five years or longer. Well, over the last 20 years, that's shifted. It's now up to 45% that actually survive, triple the amount survive. And a lot of people say, well, that's because of the internet and, and different access to information and increased focus on small business. Because everybody understands how small to medium-sized business makes a big difference in the economy of just about every uh, country in the world these days. So, so that's very good. But I got to tell you, when you look at business growth, it's a whole different story. 85% of all businesses never reach a million dollars in sales. At least, you know, I pull these stats from the United States uh, Small Business Administration. So only 15% of all businesses hit a million dollars in sales or more. Of the ones that hit a million, 95% of those never hit 5 million. And of the ones that hit 5 million, 98% of those never hit 10 million. So it's like it drops like a cliff. And so one of the things that I started to look at is why is that? Now, first of all, the good news is that some actually do. I mean, every single big business used to be small. So we know that it's physically possible. So we want to discover what it does. As possible. But I want to understand, too, the traps of why so many don't. So if you take a look, I mean, I've got four different spinning plates. You know, if I'm an architect, for example, you know, I've got to do the conceptual design. I've got to understand the needs of, of, of my client. I've got to, you know, figure it out, do block schematics, all this kind of stuff, work with my team. And we build out, we build out the uh, working drawings. We bring it to tender. We get a contractor in. And at some point, a couple of years down the road, the thing is built. A lot of work, very complex. So that's pretty complex. Now, no matter how complex that role is, 
owning a business that does that service. Let's say I own an architectural business, okay? I need to in find and then entice customers to actually come work with me, okay? So that's the sales and marketing. So there's all the energy around that. I still have to do all those things that the architect would have to do with or without his or her team. Um, I, then I have to figure out how do I price it? What about the terms? What about, you know, the financing? How do I handle my aged accounts receivable when people aren't paying as fast? I've got accounts payable and I, people I owe money to, you know, as far as that's concerned. And then of course, the, so that's its own spinning plate. And the fourth spinning plate that's on this is the people finding and enticing the right people to, to join me, um, making sure that I pay them appropriately, making sure I pay them enough so they want to stick around, but not so much that I can't afford to keep them, making sure that I'm putting the right training in, but again, while I'm putting the training in, making sure that I'm not actually setting things up so they'll just take my training and go work for my competitor. You know, Now, if I got all that stuff sorted out, if you take a look back to our architect in our building, if I get that all sorted out, an architect builds the building, the building's done, it's solid building, lasts 50 years. With a business, doesn't quite work like that. If you'll notice, there's this ball at the bottom of, the, of the, this whole thing, because the market is constantly changing. So what's happening is, on the one hand, I've got this thing and I'm trying to balance, balance it on an evolving marketplace. I mean, you know, it's interesting, uh, if you take a look at oil prices today versus oil prices a year ago, they're half. That changes the dynamics for a bunch of people. Three years ago, did anybody know anything about Instagram? It didn't even exist. Today, people are asking questions. How do I promote and get sales and marketing using my Twitter account without looking like it's sales? Well, 10 years ago, nobody knew what Twitter was. It's because nobody had figured it out yet as, as to that it exists. So you've got a constantly changing marketplace. So it's actually a real talent just to actually get a business to a certain size. And then when you get it to that size and you find that balance point in the marketplace, then you try to grow. And when you try to grow, the balance just goes completely out the window. And so you got to start again. Well, I get more sales and marketing, but then I need more people and then I need more cash. But my, and my production delivery isn't quite as strong. But, you know, if I don't give this customer what they need, they're going to go away. So I need to actually make sure that I expand enough to give them what they need. And, you know, it, it really is a constant juggle. And so it's, it's sort of balancing that piece that's the biggest single challenge for business owners after they've reached a balance point to try to grow to different levels. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, 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 I love everything that you said there. It, it really is, you know, I, I say this often, struggle is the university of life. It's easy to be successful and it's easy to be, we actually talked about this in another context earlier on today, that, that in times of adversity, it, you really test relationships, you test yourself, you test your, your systems and processes. And I think what you're saying is that the business is always in adversity as soon as you think about growth, because it sets off that balance. Oh. You're injecting adversity. Growth is adversity. Well, it is. It can also be very exciting, though. Yes. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's bad adversity. Okay. It's not bad struggle. Uh, it, it's, it's just challenge. It's a challenge that needs to be overcome, right? And, Absolutely. Yeah, no and shortage. It's a reward. It's a lot of fun to overcome these kinds of challenges. Um, you know, I, I, I have a friend who often says that challenges are just opportunities in disguise. So th this is kind of what you're talking about. So let's, let's talk about, you know, why you've just got these four plates spinning on, on, on sticks on top of it. Because, I mean, I think sometimes from an entrepreneur standpoint, I think I've got way more going on than just those four pillars. Well, keep in mind that, that each of those four have so many subcategories that you could probably draw 50 and you wouldn't be out of line. Okay. okay. I mean, you know, the truth is that there's lots going on. It's a constantly dynamically shifting environment. And, and so on the one hand, it can be exciting. On the other hand, it can also be fraught with, um, with heartache and stress. You know, and it's interesting because what I find is that if there's one single word that would summarize what every single entrepreneur wants from their business, Govin, we haven't talked about this. What do you think that word would be? Uh, simplicity. Uh, actually, you know what? They really would like simplicity, no question. But, you know, they don't get into business for the simplicity. But once they get in there, they wish they had it. I completely agree with that. The one word that I was thinking of was freedom. Yeah, uh, I mean, freedom, uh, absolutely. 
It's the number know, one reason it, to be an entrepreneur. And now think of all the people that you've interviewed with regards to paper napkins. Isn't there an underlying theme there? People want more freedom. They want more financial freedom. They want, they want to have the time to do what they want when, whenever they want. They Absolutely. want to have the financial backing t- to be able to do it. They don't want to be bazillionaires. Some do. But the truth is what we really want is freedom as entrepreneurs. Absolutely. You know, and, and growth is access to freedom for many. Now, that said, I love your, the, the, the word you came up with, simplicity, because the truth is, you know, as humans, we're designed to look for the easiest way. I mean, as we form a habit that grows into our brain, I mean, if you read Charles Duhigg, he talks about a habit actually goes into your, your system in such a way so that the brain doesn't have to work so hard and you can focus on other things. So we're always looking to make it easier. It's part of our natural instincts as humans. Mm-hmm. So as a result, one of the traps that entrepreneurs fall into is they're always looking for formulas and silver bullets. Yeah, if only this was the right answer, if only that was the right answer. So anything that looks like a silver bullet, they'll go after. And and in fact, it's funny, that, that's why I started collecting these napkins, right? Uh, it was the magic wand. It was the silver bullet that I could wave over my business and my life and make everything better. Yeah, and how many paper napkins have you, have you amassed? Uh, more than a thousand. Yeah, and, and got a silver bullet yet? No. no it, well, except for the fact that there is no silver bullet. Yeah, that by itself is an. That's what they call a gem of wisdom. Indeed. The uh, but but each napkin, I bet you, has a dimension or an aspect or perspective that allows somebody access to something. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of wisdom in every one of these. I mean, there's huge stories, secrets of success around each one of these things. But the secret of success is that it's not a secret. It's hard work. It's it's challenge. It's it's opportunity, you know, it's fighting through the challenge and finding balance on simplicity on the other side of it. Well, you know what they say that, that, that satisfaction doesn't come from reducing the risk. Satisfaction comes from winning in the face of the risk. Otherwise they'd make roller coasters flat. Yeah. It makes sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the ride that's is, is half the fun. Now that said, you know, the question is, okay, so there's no secret formula. There's no, you know, there's no, way to do that. The question is, well, then how would an owner look to grow their business? I mean, they've got a certain balance point. And we work a lot with people that are established in businesses and got them to certain size and they want to go to whatever the next level is for them. And so we deal with this kind of stuff all the time. And so, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts that need to evolve together over time. But, but the truth is that there is a way to start. And again, this is not some magic formula. It's not, you know, secret to success. But, but the question is, what can I do if I want to grow? The first thing that I have, I've got three things here that I want to share with you. One is for a business owner to want to start the growth process on the shoulders wherever they've established themselves, the first thing they have to do is treat themselves as the company's most valuable asset. Do you know how many professional services business owners, and I pick on that for a reason and I'll come back to why, stay up at night doing their own bookkeeping? Oh, I mean, so many. So many. Yeah. Bookkeeping can be done for anywhere from $15 to $30 an hour by a part-time person that can help. And even if you went to the accounting firm themselves, they're 60 bucks an hour, even with the, with the person, with the accounting firm's markup. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's it. You know, that's at a full on uh, accounting firm. Um, most professional services people I know are anywhere from a hundred to $350 an hour. Yeah. And, you, and certainly if you're in the business of providing professional services and you're not in that range, it may not be that's sustainable. All- Correct. And, 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 you know, if you think you'd do better at doing the $20 an hour bookkeeping, then do that instead of running a business. Like if, if that's actually more lucrative, you should do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, otherwise, if I can have somebody handle some of these other things for me, what it does is it frees me up to do what I do best, which goes to the second point, which is free yourself up. 
So treat myself as, as the most valuable asset in my company. The second thing to do is to free myself up. And the way to do that is to actually bring in a right-hand person that helps me do the things that, that others can do so that I can be freed up to do the things that only I can do. And isn't it true that one of the things that I've learned through the napkins, one of the napkins was growth is not an addition thing, it's a subtraction thing. We have to let go of things to move forward. And it's true. actually a great truth that the, 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 as humbling as it can be for a lot of us, the things that only we can do are really, really small. Like there, there isn't a big list of stuff that only we can do. We're highly replaceable in a lot of things. And, and it's, it's a really powerful thing to only focus on those things that, that only we can do. That, those few things, those very precious few things, because that's where our incremental value is, isn't it? Absolutely. The other side of it, though, is that a lot of people say, yeah, well, you know, others could do it, but I need a highly trained person. And, and Max is on my team, but he's already full. And he could probably do some of the stuff that I do, but Max is full. Okay. Well, guess what? Jerry can do some of the stuff that's on Max's plate. And Janine can do some of the stuff that's on Jerry's plate. So if I get Janine to do some of the stuff that's on Jerry's plate, it frees Jerry up enough so that Jerry can help Max do stuff that's on, you know, uh, that's on my plate. And then it's, you can sort of pass it down. And, as a re and if I need to hire somebody, I'll hire somebody at the lowest level. Let's say I need to hire an assistant to help Janine so that she can actually help out Jerry and Jerry can help out Max. Max can help out me. The bottom line is I pay somebody at the lowest level and, and through the, the, this process, I actually free up some of my time. And if I can't do more with the freed up time that I have than paying somebody at the lowest level, again, I have a different issue. Yeah. You know, now that also leads to the third thing. And that's that as I grow, I not only need to treat myself as the company's most important asset, not only free myself up, but then focus on my own top strengths and really grow the company around those. Because the truth is where I'm probably bleeding red ink in my company is in the areas that I'm not even very good at anyway. The areas that I'm really strong at, those are the areas where I bring maximum value. That's what customers will want from me and my firm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the more that I can build up the capabilities around that, first of all, because I'm as strong as I am at those, I recognize talent when I see it way better than the areas that I'm not as strong at. You know, now, I can also partner with people that are strong in other areas, but the truth is that depending on the size of the company, you know, I may just find that, that just by going narrower, like you said, let go, I could actually focus on the areas that I, that I you know, wanted to focus on that would actually make the biggest difference to clients because that's what they're paying for. They're not paying for the stuff I'm no good at. So if I, as an owner, if I actually treat myself as the most important asset and I actually free myself up using my staff to support me and then I focus on my own top strengths and I grow the entire company as it evolves around those, what I find is that it's actually easier to handle all those spinning plates and stuff because they start to theme into one organization rather than just a whole bunch of pieces that I have difficulty with. Yeah, so, I mean, that really is easy to understand if we're thinking about a service-based company. How, how do we do that same thing if, if I'm making um, telephones? Okay, so the first question is, what was it about making telephones that got you into that business in the first place? I promise you there's a strength there with the owners, and the strength will either be in the networks that they know how to generate. It'll be in the operational excellence that they can actually develop in terms of the manufacturer of the telephones. Or if they're distributor of phones, it's the deals that they cut with suppliers that give them a price advantage. You know, again, even in a product-based business, there's something that the owners bring to the table so that they actually create this advantage for themselves. And, you know... It's interesting because one of the things that I've seen, especially in product-based businesses, where strategic alliances can make real good sense, but when strategic alliances make the best sense, it's a combination where one party brings the channel or the sales capability and the other party brings the technology or the production capability. And that's when you get the best marriages in strategic alliances or joint ventures. So if I'm strong on one but not the other, as opposed to trying to be both, I could actually look and see who in the marketplace is actually good at the other. 
and then look and see how I can line up with things. And I run my company in, in concert with somebody else's. And as long as I can find people with a core values fit, which I'd look for in staff anyway, uh, but I look for those in, in partners and strategic alliances and things like that, I, you know, I can actually generate something where I do what I'm best and I work with somebody that does what they're best and the customer is way better off. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, this makes so much sense to me when I, when I think about it, because that's really what Apple did, right? They, 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 in order to accelerate, they went back from as many products as they had. I can't even remember, but they cut it down to five and went forward again. And they focused on the things that they were best at. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it was all about thinking. It was all about thinking differently. The products that were out there, the thought products that were that that showed that they were thinking differently, uh, and and designed beautifully, and all of those things, they they brought them to life. Well, you you can even look at, at Apple's nemesis, yeah, Microsoft. You know, there are others that built operating systems. What Bill Gates was good for was developing connections and cutting deals in creating alliances with people. That's why the networking that occurred in terms of sharing different resources, that's how, that's how Microsoft grew because there were other competing operating systems there. It was his ability to actually develop networks that, and, and distribution chain. That's why while Apple went one direction, he went a completely different direction. And you can say who won between the two, you know, I think there's a lot of people in this world would be fine with either role. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just saying that I'd rather, I'd like to be the loser on either, on either side of that. The, so, so when we think that back to your napkin and thinking big not enough, being enough, you know, where, you know, you, you talked about, um, uh, these three steps, right? Treating yourself as, as, as the company's most valuable asset, freeing yourself up and, and, and patterning or focusing the company along my strengths. Is, is, is that the system to get beyond just thinking big? Is that how well, you start acting big? Here's what I would say on a scale of one to 10. That's the first point one. Okay. But it's a great place to start. You know, thinking big is not enough because the energy of vision, while it's so compelling, needs structure behind it. The question is, what would be a first few steps in developing structures that start to give me the site that I need to actually grow the company? There's still all those moving plates and there's still all those systems and, and you know, and procedures and all the various things that need to go with it. But at the same time, um, you know, what I was looking at was where could you start? Because it is an organic process. As you, as you evolve along the way, it will be a constantly dynamic, changing situation. So is that the system? No, but it's a good start to the system. Um, it, it's interesting because when I, when I spoke with Louise, the owner of the, the business that, you know, who was able to quintuple her business in, in three years, you know, she discovered that there were a number of things that she thought that didn't turn out to be true. You know, first thing she thought was when I went over to England, I was, I was going over to make her investment ready. Because she thought, well, you have to have investors if you want to grow, you know, because if you don't have investors, how can you grow? I mean, they have Dragon's Den, you've got Shark Tank, you've got all these places that are looking for money. Well, yeah, except here's the other side of it. First of all, 78% of all businesses in first world countries are, are service-based businesses. The second thing is, if you grow by selling more, you don't have to pay anyone back. She kind of liked that idea. The other side of that was that, if I grow and I take on a bunch of money, first of all, I'll probably lose too much of my company to make it worth it. But even if I don't, if I take a bunch of money and I don't have the structures in place yet, it's a little bit like a kid in a sweet shop. You'll end up losing the money. The money just goes away now. It's somebody that I owe or somebody that owns part of my show, but I really haven't gotten the benefit of the money. As I build the structures, then I can actually support that. And the structures are constantly evolving every step of the way. Yeah, and you know, going back to freedom, one of uh, another paper napkin wisdom lesson was the structure sets us free. And and you know, if you want mad freedom, you need epic levels of structure, and Absolutely. that's how it works. You bet. Uh, you know, anybody that's at a fifty million dollar company going to a hundred million, 
they either already have that lesson or they learn it pretty darn quick. And that's the biggest single thing that stops companies at 50 million going to 100 is the lack of structure and processes to support things. And it's fascinating because people can go from 10 to 40 or 50 fairly quickly. But I got to tell you, what catches up with them is any lack of process or structure that they've got. Because you, you, you hit a hard wall somewhere between 40 and 50 million. So it's not just at 1 million or 2 million or 5 or 10. This game continues to evolve all the way along different levels of growth. Yeah, and the challenge gets even uh, e- even bigger because, you know, you, if you say 15% make it past a million um, from your earlier numbers, then, yes. then of that group, only 5% per- percent make it past 5 million. Then of that group, only 2% make it above 10. You know, I, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing drop-off. And, and you know, I, I, I've been willing to wager that those ones that make it through that process really well one time and develop systems and processes around that and structure, mad structure, epic structure, then enter the game again the next time out at that higher level of structure. No question. The other thing is, you know, you know the biggest single reason why entrepreneurs don't grow? What's that? And I mean, I've checked in with a bunch, okay, on this one, and he, they just don't know how. Some people say, well, I didn't deserve it, or there's this, or there's that, or this was there, or the bank was there. No, they just don't know how. So the other thing, if there was one other sort of gem that I'd leave you with, I mean, I'd love it if everybody went out and got a consultant, people like me would be all happy, and which is fine. But the truth is, you know, whether it's to find a mentor in your industry, whether it's to actually build an advisory board, whether it's to tap the wisdom of others. The thing I love about your paper napkins is it's a series of pieces of wisdom collectively from sages and a, and a whole host of people that have actually got the scar tissue and understand it. And and they sound like simple truths, but they're born of depth that, that you know, of years of work. So, so if, you know, if somebody who wants to grow to a different level, you know, looks and finds somebody who's either helped somebody through that process or has actually gone through it themselves, you know, finding a, a, a wise individual who's gone through the journey, they know that my journey is not going to be the same as yours, and they're not going to sit there and try to prescribe some formula on you. What they're going to do is they're going to quietly support you to find the right path for you. But the best thing they'll do is they'll help you avoid the traps, the myths, the misconceptions that stop business growth. And that's the true value of both mentors, advisory boards, or outside resources. But isn't that, you know, that's, that's so powerful because it's the underlying philosophy. If I don't know how, or if I feel like I don't know how, or if I haven't figured it out, and people might just say, hey, you know, I, I know how to grow, but I haven't figured out how to make it happen. That's sort of the same thing. I mean, it's just it, not knowing how to do it is not separated from not knowing how to execute against it, right? Right. I mean, it's sort of the same thing. It and then, is. And then blaming the bank and blaming the lack of appropriate staff resources or money or whatever is just not finding a way to solve that problem. So, so isn't, isn't the, it, by extension, not knowing how it just has us stop trying. And when we stop trying, that's when we're not growing anymore. We're just not even trying to grow. Because well, we, we get disillusioned out. and we get stuck where we're at. And rather than this access to freedom, we actually become enslaved by our businesses. And let's not kid ourselves. Sometimes the bank cuts somebody's line in credit in half. Um, three months before, or a number of months before, I went to England. Uh, this woman got her line of credit cut in half. That was very real. So all of a sudden, her ability to actually float receivables, you know, it shrunk in an environment where she's trying to grow. I mean, so it's not like those, those threats aren't real. The, the wonderful thing, though, is if you can tap the power of the human spirit, There's nothing as powerful, in my opinion, on earth as the power of the human spirit to actually rise to a challenge and overcome it. And, you know, with guidance and support and a little direction along the way, again, from that advisory board or what have you, you'd be amazed at what people can accomplish in the face of all that adversity, in the face of all that challenge, and in the face of the constantly changing environment. And that, in my opinion, is what makes it truly exciting to grow a business. That's awesome, Michael. Uh, I mean, I, I think we could talk about this for a while longer. And I know I'm going to have you back again, but our time's up today. Michael, thank you so much for sharing this with me. Well, thanks for having me again. 
Hey, if you liked that episode, there's a ton more like it on iTunes. Just search Paper Napkin Wisdom. Go to papernapkinwisdom.com to find the blog and pictures of all of the paper napkins. Plus, you can also follow along on Facebook, find Paper Napkin Wisdom on Twitter at Wise Napkin. My name is Govan J. Robin. This is Paper Napkin Wisdom. Thanks for watching. Make it a great day.